parents started singing this one nigun like at the dinner table when we were waiting between washing our hands and eating the challah on Friday mm-hmm. night and it went like Welcome, you have entered the house of Neshama, hosted by myself, Ariel Rachel. And me, Isla Biza. So, what are we doing here? The House of Nishma podcast is a place where we muse over Jewish culture, rituals, and humor. Quite about the complications of our own Jewish identities. Yes, and we do so in hopes of sparking necessary conversations and reflections with other Jews across the diaspora. In other words, you can consider this podcast the matzo ball soup of the wandering Jewish soul. And in the soup today, we are joined by our very first guest, the incredible, inventive, soulful, multi-talented Marnie Lofman. Otherwise known as Singing Jewess. Marnie is a self-described collaborative being as well as a song, prayer creator, performer, educator, and so, so much more. Most of their work surrounds music, education, connection, and healing. And for those who may not know, they're the composer behind our show's theme music. Yes, the theme music you've been hearing and all those lovely transitions, that is all the beautiful singing and playing of Marnie. So it's truly such a blessing to have work with them and just to be connected because, I mean, me and Issa started off solely as fangirls of their music until the day came and I cold DM'd Marnie via Instagram, basically saying, you know, hi, hello, we love you. And like, no big deal, but your voice is the sound of our project soul, our Neshama, you know, basically asking if they would be interested in creating original music for our show. And thus the start of our work together and connection was born. Yes, so in this episode, you will hear Marnie muse over something called nigonim, which translates into English most simply as wordless melodies often heard in different prayer spaces and across the expansive and diverse Jewish music world. Yes, and in their words, it's something that exists in everyone. And it's even a language of our soul beyond words. And on the topic of words, though, we are excited for you to sit with Marnie's reflective and wise words about its fascinating history, contemporary revival, and generative healing and just creative life that Nigunim has taken off within Marnie's own musical, religious, spiritual world. And they even offered us a musical treat of a new song they chose to play for us. So you'll definitely want to stick around for that after the interview. And I mean, Issa, you were there. I mean, this all sounded like a really special interview. Yeah, it was super special to me. Marnie and I bonded over our shared passions of music and the concept of holding space for things like languages and healing through the cathartic act of making sound. Basically, how the voice can heal. So, get comfortable and prepare yourself for an insightful and beautiful journey. We hope this episode takes you on. And I know that's what it did for me. Yeah, stay tuned. We want to acknowledge that this episode dives into Marnie's personal experience and relationship to Nigunim. The full history of Nigunim is multifaceted, complex, and cannot be covered in a single episode. So we invite you to learn more by visiting the resources in our episode description. So we would like to welcome Marnie Lofman, aka Singing Jewess, which totally explains them, from TikTok and Instagram, and just a super, super cool person, Ningun Powerhouse. Yeah, I'm just like really happy that you're here. Um, how, how have you been since we last talked? I've been good. I've been traveling and doing a little adventure. I drove from Hartford, Connecticut to outside of Denver, Colorado in the mountains. I made my way across the country with one of my best friends and uh Mm. she's not american so she's never seen a lot of places in the country before we stopped in uh yes we started in hartford we stopped in pittsburgh we stayed in ann arbor michigan in wisconsin in minneapolis in omaha 
and landed in Colorado. And I've been out in Colorado just doing staff training for my summer job um, with a Jewish wilderness therapy program, working mm-hmm. as a Jewish life and learning coordinator. So leading morning rituals and wow. um, and helping think about curriculum and how to weave mm-hmm. in Jewish wisdom and text and spiritual life into therapeutic lenses and nature environmental based lenses it's really really nice to be living a little bit off the grid in the mountains we have no cell service there's one building that has wi-fi um but you know i've been sleeping on the ground in a tarp for the past two weeks Mm -hmm. and uh just outside cooking outside sleeping outside living outside and that's been really special doing a lot of singing with people is really nice too like for me that's a really therapeutic and important part of jewish life and jewish practice and um music is really expressive for me and is one of my favorite parts of jewish community it's so nice when you can bring your own skills and like almost like your own talents. Singing is used as such like a tool of healing. The idea of song as healing or music as healing and what role that plays in our trauma. And then also just in general, like Jews carrying trauma, both as individuals and just human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of Mm -hmm. life. And as Jewish people that have these intergenerational experiences and with all our other Mm -hmm. intersectional identities that we carry with us that bring their own histories and their own heritages in our body. So like just carrying so much with us and, and how it, to me, it's interesting because I think for some people, Jewish identity and Jewish experiences have caused them trauma, like from mm-hmm. within Judaism, whether mm-hmm. it's like religious trauma or like the guilt, shame associated mm-hmm. with certain religious upbringings and things like that. And depending on how much autonomy that a person has in choosing their Jewish path can really change your relationship to how healing Judaism is or is not for you, um, mm-hmm. which you know, is a really interesting story because for some people coming to Jewishness and finding Jewish culture and identity and practice is so healing. And for other people where it was like forced on them in Mm -hmm. certain ways, it's the opposite where it's like, it's not coming from a place of agency and choice. So then it's not healing. Um, And for some people, they found different aspects of Judaism throughout their life. Like maybe one way was forced on them, but then they found a different path that was meaningful and brought them hope and healing. And, but to answer your question, about like the music and some of the stuff that I mean at least I really agree with what you're saying about the idea that music and singing is extremely healing and there's a very mm-hmm. strong Jewish tradition for the vo- like for the voice and vocal music in general and um and also from a scientific perspective your vocal cords or your vocal folds are mm-hmm. literally stimulate parts of your nervous system that are connected oh, wow. to your vagus nerve, which is a part Ooh, so of scientific. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, your vagus nerve yeah, is a yeah, part yeah. of your kind of response to danger. It's connected to your these two responses: your sympathetic response and your parasympathetic response, which are like what tell your body either I am in danger or I am safe. And so That's when so cool. we there's a lot of different wisdom traditions that use like humming or breathing or singing or chanting as like a mode of calming meditation, prayer or ritual. And I think from a from a biological perspective, our bodies are calmed down and our nervous system is stimulated in a calming way just by humming or the vibration of your mm-hmm. vocal cords. It's a very powerful physical tool. So like the fact that our prayer is full of music or vocalizing or that we feel this visceral sense of calm, connection, longing, peace, emotionality when we sing makes a lot of sense to me because of how connected, Mm -hmm. you know, our voice is to, you know, our nervous system and our nervous system reactions. So I think it's, I think it's a really cool question of like the power of voice. I mean, our tradition has known this for a long time, but science is giving new language to Mm -hmm. it in new ways, but that, you know, our voices literally do heal. And you have Jewish thinkers throughout history who talk about the healing power of music or the way music helps us to like um, ease chaos or ease our own ailments on multiple levels. Like our emotional world and our physical world are very interconnected with each other. And the voice is like this, this 
way of being that moves between emotional and physical. It's like extremely mm-hmm. physical, but it also taps into this other part. It like it's a literal kind of it exemplifies the bridge between our physical and emotional selves that are very much connected, but we don't always think about how connected they are. Yeah. They are. And like, I don't know, that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes when I'm anxious, like you have like, you know, you lose your words, right? But like, for some reason, singing is so much e- like easier or like it's easier to tap into if, if you're anxious and you need something to calm you down. you mentioned your upbringing and and practicing Nungun and Nungunim. I grew up Jewish, very kind of traditional observant context between the conservative and modern Orthodox worlds um, and had my foot in different spaces. But I always loved singing and I always would sing to myself. Even as a young person, I have like so many memories of just like walking and talking to myself in melody. Like I would be talking to myself, but I didn't really know what words I was saying. I would just use words to make, in order to make up tunes and melodies. Or I remember like sitting on the bus as a little person and looking out the window and like sing talking to myself. Or I would like read books, but I would just use the books as an excuse to make up melodies, so I wouldn't be paying attention to the words, but I would read the words to a tune, which I really love doing. Um, and is your question when I first encountered Yeah, when you first um, encountered, yeah, and um, I guess, you know, the teachers involved. When, when did you first, I guess, hear one? Um, and maybe in school or maybe from a parent or yeah. a teacher? Yeah, it's hard exactly to remember because mm-hmm. I think nigunim and nigun is such like a integrated part of Jewish life and Jewish prayer. And so since I grew up in Jewish prayer spaces, like I was always hearing melodies being used to the prayers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the first time and so and it felt like such an intuitive part of who I was and how I communicated with myself and in life. And mm-hmm. when I was in high school, there's... um a Jewish musician named Joey Weisenberg who kind of made it his project for a while to revive the nigun and like Jewish nigun singing in community and kind of unearthed and revived a lot of old Jewish nigunim from Eastern Europe and brought them to contemporary Jewish communities um, in something that's now very popular called the nigun circle and so um, he came to my synagogue when I was in high school and sang some um, melodies and did a melody workshop and that my parents started singing this one nigun like at the dinner table when we were waiting between washing our hands and eating the challah on Friday mm-hmm. nights um, and it went like I, I like distinctly remember it. It's very popular now. Uh-huh. Like, my parents like saying it all the time. I actually thought it was so annoying at some point. Like, I was like, yeah, like this is like really yeah. annoying. Uh, they sang it over and over and over again. I remember like hearing them just at Temple. I didn't know that it was something that I could like learn so yeah I don't know if you thought that yeah well it's also I mean for me it felt very intuitive because melody was something that I always did before I even knew what nigun was or like before it was something that had you know before it was like capital N nigun like in its Mm -hmm. context of like this is this thing that we're reviving and we're singing in community and we're making a thing now Um, Because there's been many histories and chapters of American Jewish music revivals. Like you have the era of like Debbie Friedman Mm -hmm. and like the American Jewish folk rock tradition. Mm -hmm. And now you have this, (laughs) like now you have this new era and phase and you have, um, you have Klezmer. Yeah, and Klezmer Mm -hmm. and um, different revivals of like Mizrahi Jewish music, Middle Eastern Jewish music and North African Jewish music. And now you Mm -hmm. have... um, Ladino. Ladino, yeah. And... 
but there's been different chapters in Jewish history of like these little spurts of energy around a certain sphere. And there's this recent one around Nigunim. So it's like, it's, it's a thing in a, in a more official kind of formal sense, but like Nigun is something that's supposed, it's something that exists in everyone. And it's like a language of our soul beyond words. And, um, a famous Hasidic rabbi talks about how Nigun is like the pen of the soul. It's the way mm-hmm. we like communicate and express ourselves on a very soul level. So it's interesting to me where like now we teach Nigunim in Hebrew schools and it's very in as like the new chapter of like Jewish yeah. music, like, you know, bringing the Nigun to synagogues and Hebrew schools. But really what it's about is about getting people connected to themselves, getting people connected to their own emotions, to their feelings, to where they're at, to their sense of authenticity and self-trust and connection with something greater and giving it, it's supposed to be a raw place of just expression of self in, in, in an authentic and unfiltered way. And that's how a lot of nigunim are thought to be composed. They are just kind of outpourings of a person's feeling and emotion. And for me, it's more interesting and important to teach children, to teach young people how to connect to themselves and how to feel authentic and expressive and alive and present Mm -hmm. than it is to teach them nigunim because we could be teaching them Mm -hmm. how to sing nigunim but they are like we could be singing nigunim in front of them but that doesn't necessarily like make a young person feel what a nigun like the place that a nigun comes from which is the nigun is supposed to come from this place of like authentic expression aliveness and presence that's something that can't be imitated that's something that everyone needs to find for themselves and to discover by connecting to themselves and learning what it means to be sensitized as a human being Mm -hmm. to be present as a human being to be in relationship with yourself and others in a real way everyone. Real quick, I just want to tell you about my longtime project, Neshama, the Jewess Soul. It is an ongoing interactive documentary and living, breathing archive that takes a deeply intimate dive into Jewish womanhood in the United States. Told from the voices of Jewish women themselves across a variety of racial, ethnic, and Judaic backgrounds, it's a place for you to hear the unique and eclectic stories, journeys, and perspectives on that crucial topic of what it means to be a Jewish woman. You can see some of the stories featured by visiting neshama.amandapeckler.com. And if you're interested in participating and simply learning more, send us an email at neshama.interact at gmail.com. All right, back to the episode. Okay, we are back with Marnie, and we are going to continue talking about Ningun. Ningunim, um, and uh, really get into how it's so powerful and how it's it's been a joy to get to know more of because I just didn't know what it was called. I just I was hearing it from um, you know growing up and going to temple and everything, but I just didn't know the specifics, even like the history. So yeah, I would love to know more about that. It's like nigun melody. Yeah, you know has a very long and human history beyond and within so many different cultures not just Judaism and it's like on the one hand you can't isolate like this kind of raw melody within your with that exists within human beings to uh, one history and it's taken on different forms and practices and popularity and meaning in different communities in different ways and the current like Nigun revival right now that we see in the U.S. that has has happened from multiple different Jewish communities and it would be really interesting to look at kind of how that's happened across Jewish Mm -hmm. communities. One of the predominant ones and the one that I'm familiar with is from kind of the Hasidic tradition of Nigunim which um, uh, kind of there was this big music revival in the 18th century in Eastern Mm -hmm. Europe with with Hasidism um, and the Baal Shem Tov, who was this like kind of great Hasidic master, mm-hmm. um, founder of Hasidut, um, who who kind of would sing these melodies that were believed to be these melodies from the soul. And you have kind of lots of lots of 
gatherings where people would think people would talk about how these melodies without words were even more powerful than words and that this music was this very raw expression of the soul um, and there was a lot of conflict within the Jewish community at that time um, and Jews that really valued learning and text and liturgy were really unhappy with these like hippy dippy Jews who just mm -hmm. wanted to sing all the time and uh, were so connected to the music, it even felt scary yeah. or dangerous or threatening to kind of the more rational, refined, um, mm -hmm. kind of head-based, mental-based Judaism. Ritual-based. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and these nigunim, these melodies, would be sung at uh, gatherings called tishes. Tish literally means mm -hmm. table. It's gathering around oh. a table to sing. Or fabrengans, mm -hmm. which are like these social gatherings where people would tell stories, sing melodies, um, drink, eat, and and to this day, kind of nigunim have traveled throughout history, been taught, been carried on through communities around tables, in circles, in prayer, um, kind of orally. And there's been different, you know, you could take the academic perspective, but also nigun, kind of in these these melodies, this place of of melodic expression is really present in our prayer service. And you have these mm -hmm. cantorial traditions across the Jewish community um, in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, and then in the United States, um, where the kinds of musical modes and styles of singing that come from the way we would sing prayer text make their way in influencing the kind of repetitive or meditative music that comes out in these nigun singing spaces, these tishes, these fabrengans, these social gatherings. Um, and so there's, a, there's constantly a conversation between these raw melodies um, in Jewish liturgical and prayer spaces and what's being sung in the community but there's also tension because the style is very different mm -hmm. maybe you know the style uh of like the role of improvisation versus rigidity how much it's connected to words and text versus how much it's supposed to be like wordless and transcendent um how it's getting taught is it getting taught you know um orally or you know as Jews are emancipated and moving into Western Europe and being influenced by the Enlightenment is it being taught through like recorded and written styles of music versus you know through community and through singing and repetition and learning in that way and so you have this constant tension that's even played out within the music between what kind of Jew you are how influenced you are by secular culture or Enlightenment or musical new you know institutional music spaces um and how much you're still in that place of like raw communal oral transmission communal transmission um improvisation creativity so it's a really interesting tension You talk about nigunim being something that lives off the page. For me, like the heart and soul of Jewish musical expression really happens not when we're reading and memorizing and learning and writing um, and over conceptualizing, but when we're embodying it and in experience with it and in relationship with others through the music. And I think that one thing that was really powerful to me that my cantor told me when I was younger, who had a more classical training, she said to me that it's only when we study something and memorize it so perfectly that then we can kind of fly free and explore and uh, improvise and feel at home in it. But learning that foundation really well is really important. And I think there are some really beautiful offerings of the more classical musical traditions that are really focused on I imitation and are focused on how do I learn this exactly as it is written and execute it and perform it exactly as it's written and what power does that have both in preserving beautiful traditions that would otherwise get lost and in really being committed to like 
yeah, to just learning something as it is or as it has been and then adding your voice to it afterwards. So that's Mm -hmm. one tradition. But then this, you know, for me, there's this other tradition that's really powerful that I think oftentimes gets overlooked. It's, you know, it's the classic tension between like folk traditions and classical traditions. Um, But that is, that is this sense of like, every single time we sing something, every single time we say something, we are adding our own voice anyway to, um, to whatever is out there. Like even if it's words, right? How many mm-hmm. times have I probably articulated words in a similar pattern that somebody else has articulated words before me? There's only so many words in the English language. There's only so many ways to say something. And I'm constantly in drawing on the same terms and expressions and syntax of other people. And yet, every time I say something, it's coming from this real, raw, Marnie place that is trying Mm -hmm. to express themselves authentically. And with music, it's too, like, to pretend that I can, that I can, that I can, like, be a neutral voice just repeating something else that someone has written and repeating it perfectly musically. It's, A, it takes away, like, the really, the beauty of expression and, like, just outpouring that can happen when we express ourselves and presence and aliveness. I think, you know, Nigun is this opportunity to let go and release some of the tension we sometimes hold where we're like, this has to be done. No, this is the way it goes. No, this is the Mm -hmm. way it goes. No, this is how the melody is written. Or no, this is the idea we're talking about. But it's actually like, okay, we're here in the present moment and we're expressing ourselves. Like, what's coming out? How can I yeah. trust myself? How can I be real? How can I make something meaningful mm. and beautiful? How can I fall into it? Yeah. How can I fall into this pattern? You kind of have some type of guideline for it, but you can kind of go off go off the top, I guess. You know? Exactly. And, and, you don't, and, and you don't even need a guideline. Like, I think that, to me, that is a really, really special uh, mm. invitation where it's like, wow, I spent so much of my life being anxious that like, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And I Mm -hmm. need to know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Mm -hmm. But I have so much in me without any planning, Mm -hmm. without any knowing, without any control or certainty. Like there's so much already here. Like, how do I like trust that and allow that to come out in every moment Mm -hmm. rather than being so hyper focused on Mm-hmm. executing something that I'm supposed to know I'm supposed to be doing, you know, and like music, certain styles of music learning and music performance and music leading are really fixated on how can I execute this well? And there's a power to that. There's a power to that. We create shared languages. We we bring music that lots of people know. But even if I knew nothing, well, let's say I got in a room with a group of people mm-hmm. And none of us had anything in common. We didn't share any language. We didn't share mm-hmm. any ideas or thoughts. We didn't share a sense of what the plan of what we were going to do together was. It would be really hard. <laughs> what, what, yeah. what would I do? But if I just pointed to myself mm-hmm. and started singing something short and then pointed to them to like, I could just make up anything or do anything and we could learn it mm-hmm. together, you know? Or if someone in the rooms just started repeating a melody over and over again, we could all create a shared voice from a place where there was no shared voice and sometimes you know like just recognizing how much already exists in any given moment and like being present with it
the power of improvisation to me. It's like this, mm-hmm. this really beautiful presence and tapping into the creativity that's a part of us. And I, I mean, I don't really like believe in God in a traditional sense. And I have my qualms mm-hmm. and difficulties with like no, same too. religious <laughs> yeah. perspectives. And yet I feel like a deeply spiritual person in other ways, even though the word spiritual feels really vague to me. And I don't know exactly what I mean when I'm saying it, like I'm still mm-hmm. figuring out my way, but But I really, there's this concept in Judaism that we're created in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim. Uh, And God is like this creative force of the universe, like this ability for things to create themselves. Like a cell is constantly recreating itself, you know, Mm. like the world is in a constant state of creation. Like, you know, the classic philosophy metaphor where it's like, if you have a ship and you replace every single one of the boards, whatever, is it still the same ship? Even if it's like, you know, you slowly replace every one of the boards and sails and parts of the ship. Is it still the same same ship, even if it looks exactly the same, but all the parts are new parts. And it's like, the world is like that. It's constantly replacing all of its old pieces. And evolving. And even in our bodies, like, I, today at the age of 26, am, I look, I feel like I've been building off of some version of myself, but every component of my body is new. The cells are mm-hmm. all like completely different than they were when I was five oh, years so old. Oh, that's so crazy. <laughs> right. And we're yeah. so like creation and the creativity mm-hmm. of the world and life in our bodies is continually yeah. happening. And when we improvise, when we bring new melody into the world, when we're just super present and authentic with where we are, we're tapping into that like, I don't know, creative power of the universe Mm -hmm. and of ourselves. And like, there are some people that will say that is like this very divine energy, that, um, Mm -hmm. that ability to just be in the act of creation and, and in the act of improvisation, because it's like, that's the creative act of the universe that's constantly ongoing. Judaism like it can shift and change how you shift and change you know like it's like for me when I was growing up I've you know I don't know I I feel like everyone has their own relationship Mm. with like religion and everything and so I'm trying to you know kind of get back into it more but like kind of to fit my own needs and spirituality and maybe not so much the religious side even your story like helps like validate mine in terms of um, being involved in it and still being um, intertwined in it without you know being a certain way or what you've been taught or what you other people expect a jew would be that's all what this podcast is about you know yeah not letting like other people define for me the boundaries of what it means for me to be jewish just because i was Mm -hmm. taught like being jewish looks like this this and that but Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna let somebody else take away being jewish from me because of like the expectations or pressures that were nest- like put on me of what it means to be Jewish, like I get to define that for myself still and to claim that in a mm-hmm. way that's meaningful for me. And I, I, I absolutely love what you just said of like comparing this metaphor of the creative mm-hmm. act and like improvisation yeah. in the music, in like go- in the story of God's creation of the world, which is like a story, but it's still a really meaningful story. Um, to like the story of Judaism and like being also maybe even the divinity or the power of Judaism is this ability for it to be constantly like recreating itself and to be alive in the process of creation that is ongoing every single day and every 10 years and every century and every, you know, millennium, whatever. And that's really, really beautiful. Like Judaism is a song. There's a metaphor um, that says like the Torah is a song and um, and even like the Talmud and it's the many voices that are constantly harmonizing with each other and expressing themselves within um, the tradition that create the beautiful tradition that it is. But the idea of it being a song, not just in the sense of many voices and harmony and dissonance, but also the idea of the Torah, Torah being a song and Judaism being a song in, in its like 
yeah, inherent creativity and like constant changing. It cannot stay the same. You know, just like a song that's written down and recorded and, mm-hmm. and, and, and a composer maybe feels like it's being performed incorrectly. <laughs> we have the mm-hmm. same thing in Judaism. It's like, wait a minute. No, this is what's written. This is what's said. Why are they yeah. doing it that way? They're performing it wrong. They're messing up all the notes, yeah. you know, like it's and, and I think there's this great attachment that people get to what Jewishness mm-hmm. is and what it means to be Judaism. Mm-hmm. But if Ju- to me, Judaism is a song. It's music. And yeah. songs evolve. Songs change. They get sung differently by different people. You know, and it's actually beautiful. People write new ones. Like, mm-hmm. and it, that's actually... But, but some of those new ones build on the patterns and tendencies of the old ones. new projects that are on the horizon or maybe hints of one that you want to promote yeah I mean I you know you can always follow me on social media and see my content as it's coming up there but I am just um finishing this year of living in kind of like an international interreligious uh multicultural community that we were doing a grad degree together in peace Mm -hmm. and conflict studies and Um, one of the kind of with that and my experience moving through lots of different Jewish communities and with music and healing and the voice, I'm like hoping to put together and kind of working on, this isn't really a promotion, but starting to work on the beginnings of a album project that is about journeying and journeys. Mm -hmm. And I recently wrote a song for the travelers, Mm -hmm. uh, prayer or the prayer for journeys. We call it Tfilat Haderach. Um, because I find myself oftentimes in limbo or in liminal spaces in my life in between mm-hmm. destinations, not quite sure where I'm going. Mm-hmm. And like we talked about, I'm very, too, yeah, that's yeah, like we talk, too. yeah, and like we talked about even with Judaism or with music, like everything is always on a journey or in a state of process or travel or transformation, even when we think there is like a fixedness and a settledness, there's always kind of movement happening. And so I feel like a theme for me is really creating um, strength and healing and expression for that process of journeying. And so I'm hoping to create like a kind of album that has lots of different voices from different communities and places um, with a bunch of my songs that relate to just like a mix of Jewish prayer, mindfulness, like some interfaith stuff, and um, the way that relates to journeys and journeying. So I have a bunch of songs that are waiting. They're waiting, and they've been waiting for a long time to like be recorded more uh, with a little more love and attention. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in the phases of kind of planning that project right now, and kind of also the, yeah, so I'm in the, I'm in the phase of planning that project, Mm -hmm. and have this one song that, uh, yeah, kind of became a thread. Like, it really just came out of me because I I get very anxious in travel. I love mm-hmm. traveling and movement, but I also get very anxious during those moments in my life, and a lot of emotions come up for me. Mm-hmm. And I was on an airplane recently. I have terrible airplane anxiety. Oh, same. <laughs> and I like, just was, turbulence. like, saw, yeah, I saw someone across the aisle from me saying that, the traveler's prayer it's filat hadera oh, wow. and in that moment even though i don't believe anyone is going to listen or protect me just because i say it i was like i need some grounding ritual to do in this moment and i have breathing exercises and lots of other things but i wanted to say the prayer at that point and i asked her if i could borrow her sidor her prayer book mm-hmm. and she gave it to me and i said filat hadera but while i was reading it i realized that i don't have any melodies for it or like I've never had it sung and like mm-hmm. I don't have a melody for it. And I was like, wow, I wish I had a, something I could sing to myself to mm-hmm. soothe myself. And that this wasn't just me mumbling, but there was a tune here because mm-hmm. there's a feeling here. And the next morning when I arrived at my destination, I was on a walk again in transit, in motion. I go on a lot of walks and I just started singing this melody to myself. And I wrote this melody for the, the, the traveler's prayer. Mm. And now, since then, every time I've been on an airplane, I like find myself humming it to myself and singing it to myself. And um, I'm just finding it to be really grounding for me in this moment of big transitions and change. Mm-hmm. And for all, like, 
especially as COVID is opening up and there's a lot more traveling and change happening too. I'm like, there's something about being able to connect to the human experience of vulnerability when we are in a state of journey and change Mm -hmm. that even if I don't believe like in a cognitive way, the words and whether they're true or not, or whether they're real or not real, they're true to my experience and they connect me to all the humans who have ever existed and will exist and Mm -hmm. do exist that are in a moment of like fear and vulnerability and anxiety when we're in that place of just, oh, I have no power Mm -hmm. while I'm in this movement and journey and um, I, I found that really meaningful. So that's such a cool story. I, I totally agree with you. When I, I am someone who, um, you know, I'm a Gemini rising, so I like to travel a lot. So I'm like, I, um, but I'm always scared, right? Before, and so, it, but yes. I always push myself in these situations. I find ways to like um, find comfort in that, even though mm. I'm like leaving my comfort zone. And even just like having someone to hand you a prayer book, it doesn't have to be your own. It, it shows like someone else is like looking out for you in some way, even though they can't like provide to you everything they can, you know, provide what they have. Um, and then you can kind of create off of that, which is, it's really cool to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that you use the language also of resilience yeah. and what it looks like to build and find resilience, even in moments we want something and mm-hmm. we know we want it and care about it mm-hmm. and value it but we may have like lots of obstacles in our way. So how do we find the resilience, the tools, the things to just give us strength, whether it's in people and relationships mm-hmm. that support one another or like words and poetry and self-expression and music. And I, I mm-hmm. love that language yeah. and framing. Did you all want me to sing the one of the songs? Like oh, to sing yes. a song or perform a song? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like if you, if you are, if you are comfortable with that. And I would love to share that song because it's really like meaningful to me. And it also feels like, a beautiful blessing for us for where we are in our lives i'm starting a job on mondays so i'm like i'm gonna take that thought with me when yeah oh i love that yeah so i'm like on my way to work i'm like so nervous i'm gonna be like thinking yes about that okay i have my guitar we are ready oh my gosh i'm so excited okay so let's see Thank you. 
ליסטים וחיות רעות by Marnie Lachman. You can find their original and covered music on TikTok, SoundCloud, and Instagram under the handle at singing underscore Jewess. Well, that's a wrap on episode five. So if we've piqued your curiosity and appetite for more matzo ball soup for the wandering Jewish soul, we invite you to follow us wherever you enjoy your podcasting. And we wanted to share that we still have open guest slots for the season. So if you are interested in coming on the show or know someone who would, feel free to DM us via Instagram at House of Neshama or drop us an email at neshama.interact at gmail.com. As always, thank you so much for the support and simply joining us on this journey. So please stay tuned and until next time.